One night, I received a phone call of the unimaginable. How could my young, healthy and so full of life mum have a heart attack? My mum was diagnosed with spontaneous coronary artery dissection, also known as SCAD, a mysterious heart attack striking younger women. Unlike a typical heart attack caused by a clot that blocks an artery, SCAD starts with a tear or a bruise, which then tunnels through the wall of the artery and blocks the blood flow to the heart. Like my mum, there are often no risk factors and patients are generally healthy, which means SCAD often goes undetected or undiagnosed. More research is needed to understand why fit, healthy people suddenly develop SCAD. Over the past few years, SCAD survivors have been heavily involved in raising awareness, supporting families and funding research into the causes and treatment. Six months after my mum's SCAD incident, she passed away from the condition. SCAD can be fatal and has taken the lives of other young women. I wanted to join survivors who are willing to tell their stories to show that the condition affects a wide range of people, most of whom have none of the normal cardiac risk factors and researchers on their mission to spread the word and find answers. So we can become a world who understands SCAD and those affected become quickly and accurately diagnosed. I began my journey in Liverpool, where I met SCAD survivors who were willing to share their stories. Each of them are a part of Beat SCAD, a patient-led charity that aims to support patients and their families raise awareness and research into the condition. For patients with a rare underdiagnosed condition, talking to and meeting someone who has been there is a very important part of their recovery. Okay, so I'm Kaz, um, I am 39 now, so very, very nearly 40. Hi, I'm Erica and I am 40. Hi, I'm Elizabeth um, and I am 48 years old. I had the opportunity to speak with Dr Adlam, who is the UK's leading researcher, who gave me an insight into the condition and where the research is currently at. Hi. Hi. So SCAD um, is spontaneous coronary artery dissection, so you can see why we shortened it. Uh, what we understand is that there seems to be the development of a, of a bruise in the wall of an artery. So if you think of a coronary artery as a tube that's taking blood to the heart muscle, heart's popping away like this, it has these tubes, arteries taking blood to the muscle that go around the outside and sort of plug in to give the heart the, the things that it needs. But your arteries are under your blood pressure, so they're pumping away at this high pressure, and so they have to have a thickness, otherwise they'd burst if they were little flimsy things, right? So they have a thickness, like almost like a tire around the artery. And the bruise in SCAD forms within that wall, within that thickness. So as the pressure rises, it actually compresses the artery from the outside and squashes it. And that means not enough blood can get to the heart muscle, and some of that heart muscle dies, and it hurts, and that's why patients present with a heart attack. It went down into the back of my arms and then I had a slight pain on my chest and then it went into my chest and it was just a bit of an explosion really. I just got a sudden chest pain, felt really sick, really sweaty and just, I didn't lose consciousness and I didn't, I just kind of went to the floor and felt like an elephant was sitting on my chest. Something made me think, oh, these are the sort of symptoms for a heart attack but I didn't think that's what it was. Around 8%, so a little bit less than one in 10 of those patients will either be pregnant or have been recently pregnant. So it's one of the um, more, most important causes of heart attacks in pregnancy or around the time of pregnancy, although, of course, heart attacks in that context are quite uncommon and one of the most important causes of heart attacks in women. I was obviously pregnant during lockdown um, and uh, had a toddler at home and was working. I was really lucky that I could work from home, but it was quite a stressful time. I just hadn't been feeling too well through pregnancy and I, I was heavily pregnant, gave birth in July and um, by a planned C-section. And then two weeks later, I had a heart attack at home. They believe it was caused, as many are, postpartum by pregnancy. There's a suspicion that the stress of 
working lockdown toddlers, the same as everyone had, um, whilst being pregnant probably didn't help and maybe uh, caused some of the scab as well. And uh, having read on about it since, I think it's quite common for women, but it didn't really, a heart attack didn't happen in the chest it, to start with. It, it starts in the shoulder blades and it, it felt like my shoulder blades were being pulled apart. But having, uh, this is my second child, two weeks in, I just had mastitis, I'm breastfeeding. You hold yourself in all sorts of weird angles to try and get the right thing going. So I just thought, to start with, it was agonizing. I was like, I've pulled a muscle really badly. I've done something really wrong. And I just put the little one down and then it went down into the back of my arms. And I, I realized I went to get try and get some paracetamol. And I got to the drawer and realized I couldn't feel my fingers and thought, this is pretty bad. And then it went into my chest and it was just a bit of an explosion really is, is probably the best way to describe it. My husband doesn't mess about and you know, we had an ambulance on the way. You know, I didn't really believe I was in it, if you know what I mean. And when I got to hospital, I was like, this is, this is a joke. Like I assume I'm going home now. All I wanted was the painkillers. When the pain was relieved at home, I, feel, I could feel the heaviness in my chest but it didn't hurt in the same way. And I thought, all right, okay, you know, we'll just go now. And then the seriousness of it, when they took me to resource at Stoke, it became a bit real. And the, and I said, oh, am I going home soon? By now, it was probably about midnight, something like that. And they were like, no, you won't be going home for a long time. And obviously I'd had to leave Will, the baby, at home. And I was like, well, this, I can't stay, what's going on? And, and so then the reality of it hit, whereas before that I was almost a bit bemused by the whole thing, like, yeah. this isn't happening to me. I'm healthy. <laughs> so I was really lucky with my diagnosis. They had done what I now know as an echo, and they were like, yeah, the front of the heart has stopped. And uh, obviously it was quite devastating words, and it was delivered not in the best way. And I just couldn't quite get my head around someone like me could have something like that. And so there was talk about stents and there lots of questions about smoking and I don't smoke, very healthy, I do a lot of exercise. So I kept trying to reiterate that I was healthy. I probably didn't look healthy. I'd given birth two weeks before. I felt like a blob. I was wearing maternity leggings. <laughs> it was not an attractive look. Thank God I'd had a shower that day. And so they were talking about that kind of thing and I was really lucky in that my cardiologist Dr. Butler had met Dr. Adlam and had heard of SCAD and so started to dig a little bit deeper before I was whisked off to a stent because we now know stents aren't necessarily the right treatment for a SCAD and it's better to try and manage conservatively, which mine is, I'm really lucky to say. He recognised it, which meant it was a different course of treatment. So as soon as I was kind of taking them to cardiology intensive care because there's, there's a big unit at Stoke then it all became a lot calmer because there was a recognition of this isn't a typical heart attack because when I, I got to the intensive care it's huge and I was the youngest there by like I think it was 40 years they said it was ridiculous the hardest impact has definitely been to my toddler because she went to bed and woke up and mummy wasn't there and then I wasn't there for a week and she'd had a lot of change you know, she just got a new brother and then when I did come back, I, was probably, I wasn't myself, I wasn't the old me. So we've mentioned a few of the known things already. So um, being female, I guess pregnancy, possibly having had lots of children, maybe. Um, and that period around the time of the menopause seems to be a sort of slightly higher risk time. So um, those are things which we, we recognise. I was perimenopausal. My scat happened on a Saturday morning. I had a nice romantic morning with my husband. And then just was coming out of the shower. And then I had a slight pain on my chest. Pains are quite normal for me because I have MS. So it was just like, oh, is this just a weird MS thing? I thought, oh, that's a bit strange. So I just sort of sat down for a bit. You know, I'd strained it or something, strained my chest muscles a bit, but no. Then I sort of got a sensation, very slight sensation going into my neck in my arm, but it's the left side, which is the side I have my MS. So it was just like, oh, it's just a weird thing. And that was pretty much it. I mean, I had palpitations as well, heart palpitations, but I'd been having those again for 
on and off for years, so it wasn't an unusual thing for me. I mean, my life around that time, it was quite stressful with work and everything, but the actual time it, my, my scad happened, it was really relaxed. They diagnosed a heart attack pretty much straight away from A&E &E with the blood test, the troponin test but I didn't actually know what it was that caused it until the Friday, just because they couldn't fit me in for an angiogram until the following Friday. So I was I felt so, such a time waster really. I was sitting in, in the hospital for a week, not feeling ill at all, in amongst all these really old, old people that were like really ill. It was on the Wednesday when the cardiologist came and said, it was talking to me and I was thinking, oh, okay. And it was just like, maybe there's lack of sleep, which is probably true. But I just burst into tears thinking, okay, I've had a heart attack. Before that I was in complete denial. And then the angiogram on the Friday was what actually diagnosed the SCAD. Weirdly, the longer it's gone on, the more anxiety I felt about it. And I think because, because it's spontaneous, if it's going to happen again, I mean, reading up about it, probably not likely to happen. There's a lot of people it doesn't happen again for, but, but he's just like, oh, am I going to be somebody that's going to happen again? Am I going to know? Especially for me, because I have pains and it's like constantly the question, is this MS? Is it? Is it scared? Is it, you know, what is it? And um, it did impact my mental health. Um, it took me a, a long time to acknowledge that, but I had turned to comfort eating and stuff because I couldn't couldn't exercise in the way I wanted to and, and do things that I really wanted to do. Not because it would physically make a difference, but I think it was like, I, I have a bit of an issue about doing things right. So if somebody tells me, oh, you can't do that, it's like, oh, okay, I can't do that and I won't do any of it. So, so yeah, it, it was just trying to find my way through what, what is okay again, um, through all the constant aches and pains that happen. You know, the occasional chest pain, oh, is that anything, is it not? Is it okay to do anything, is it not? And it's, it's constantly questioning, but I've got a letter back to, after my last MRI to say that there's no obvious scarring, no obviously sort of damage, then I feel a lot more relaxed about going forward and doing what I want to do. I think because I feel comfortable now exercising more, which was initially like, from, from my MS, I, I was a runner before that. My MS causes me to have foot drops, so I can't run anymore. So then during lockdown, I found yoga. And I was like, yeah, I love yoga. And and then the scad with the scad, they don't recommend doing certain yoga poses. I'm like, oh, so my second love is now taken away. <laughs> Even though it's not, because it's just certain things I've got to be aware of. So yeah, that was that was my main one of my challenges. But now it's like figuring out what what I can do, and I'm okay with that. It's just finding my next new love to do. My mum was 49 when she passed away with it. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I didn't yeah. know that, so I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, that's why I want to make this film. Okay, cool. Yeah, well, I think, you know, there's... Obviously, that particular scenario is very uncommon. Mm. Um, um, but, you know, it does happen occasionally and is very tragic when it does happen. Uh, and I guess also it's... Um, I guess gives us a really important drive and motivation to try and understand the condition, uh, try to educate people um, who are in healthcare and are also in the in the public more, uh, more widely about the condition, so that people recognise it early, so that you know people who are poorly with it can be you know taken to a place of safety and looked after and treated as needed as soon as possible. I have my SCAD when I was 34, for no apparent reason, so not postpartum, not I wasn't doing anything particularly strenuous, just they don't know why. It was Mother's Day in 2015. My 
partner and I were at the local cemetery because we decided to go and do his mum's grave so we were tidying her up and doing a bit of gardening. I've been there for about half an hour, it's not particularly strenuous and I bent down, picked up a daisy and just got a sudden chest pain. Felt really sick, really sweaty and just, I didn't lose consciousness and I didn't, I just kind of went to the floor and felt like an elephant was sitting on my chest. I knew something wasn't quite right. Thankfully, Ian was with me and he's a fireman and he recognised the signs of potential heart attack. So he picked me up, skipped me in the car and drove me to the local hospital, which is literally just a couple of streets down. When they took me to, got into A&E and they didn't initially diagnose it as heart issues. Didn't believe me. <laughs> so they basically said, initially they thought I was having uh, indigestion and that I was, uh, that my, I couldn't breathe. It, I, it really felt like I had an elephant on my chest. Really distressing and excruciatingly painful. But the nurses didn't, they, they saw how young I was and uh, they didn't seem to take much notice. So they did do uh, an ECG. But then the ECG came back negative, so it was didn't seem to have any issues. So they just said, stop hyperventilating, it's indigestion. So they then kind of put me in a, a wee room for a few hours and eventually I went into the trolleys where I was still having problems and they still didn't believe I was having any issues. And then they, I think it was about five hours later, a lovely young doctor came past and she saw that I didn't have a cannula in my arm. So she realised that they hadn't done any blood tests and she hit the roof uh, to say pretty mildly. They did some blood tests, but while I was doing it, the nurse said, mm, indigestion can be painful, you know. So even then they didn't believe me. But when the blood test came back an hour later, the troponin protein that they checked for was slightly high. So they then did it again about four hours later, I think it was. And they came back and went, yeah, you've you've had a heart attack. And then suddenly they were interested. I was diagnosed about three days later. The, ho the first hospital I went to was on the Wirral and they did an initial uh, angiogram and they noticed that um, the artery um, was narrowed. I have an extra, it's called a ramus artery, so one of my arteries kind of tri trisects it or bisects and it runs in the back of my heart. And it was that that had basically narrowed quite a lot. So they knew there was something going on but didn't quite know what. So the next day, so that was day three, they transferred me over to Liverpool Heart and Chest where they did another angiogram. And then they realised that I had a, a scad, that it was a tear. Um, but it actually torn from basically the top of the artery right the way down to the bottom. So they couldn't um, stent it, so they just managed it medically. Um, but yeah, it was, it's, it was very strange because of course you're young, you don't expect to have a you know, 34 year old. I was fit, I was a scuba diving instructor, I was hill walking, rock climbing, motorbikes, that kind of stuff, quite fit. So suddenly to have a heart attack and feel really bad was quite impactive. They didn't initially call it a SCAD either, they just said it was a sudden dissection. And my partner actually discovered a beat SCAD on the internet, he did a Google search for it and it came back as SCAD. So he went, is that it? And he went, oh yeah, that, that, that sounds like it. Yeah, that, that'll be it. And that's when we meet the, the beat SCAD people. Um, and where we started getting answers, really. I think we have to remember that whilst SCAD has been recognised for many years, serious research in terms of looking at, you know, many hundreds of cases in, in, in observational data sets really began by amazing colleagues in uh, the Mayo Clinic and Vancouver General Hospital who, if you like, have sort of established this area. And we're talking about really less than 10 years ago that this all began. So for us to be talking about genes that we know are associated with this condition uh, and to have some understanding of, of things like associated phenotype, the FMD story that we talked about, you know, these are quite impressive pieces of progress. And alongside that, there's been a great deal of increased understanding of the condition amongst clinicians. So, for example, SCAD now appears in some of the European guidelines for myocardial infarction for the first time uh, recently. A long way to go. 
we still have many patients that we speak to whose um, you know whose condition is not recognised you know immediately. Um, sometimes not until a recurrence occurs, and then people look, look back at the first angiogram and go, "Oh, maybe that was a scan." You know, so these things still happen. There's a long way to go in terms of education. I think the prospect of moving research towards clinical trials is key. It's clearly difficult because it's not a common disease, but there are enough patients internationally if people work together for us to be able to do proper studies that really allow us to, um, you know, get data to give patients clearer, clearer advice about what works and what doesn't work. In terms of dissemination, so in terms of kind of understanding, you know, this is a sort of a job in progress. Um, you'll be aware of the organisation BeatScat as a patient-led organisation who do amazing work in terms of outreach. So I was told about it by my cardiologist um, when he said, uh, we think this is a SCAD, I want to manage it conservatively. I was still in the middle of all the scans in hospital. Um, he mentioned Dr. Adlam and he mentioned Facebook. And I was like, how is a Facebook group going to help me? I was totally snobby about it. Um, like, this is ridiculous. And then found them, joined them, and um, it is the hub of all information and people that make you feel normal, frankly. A and E with nothing else else to do other than scrolling on, scroll on my phone, waiting for testimonies to come back. And I think I really looked at the website then, and the stuff that's on there is amazing. All the information is is phenomenal. And so we used to do the kind of get together in, in Leicester, um, and that was really nice because I got to meet people who've had it because I'd never met anybody who had it before. And I think a lot of the time I feel that doctors don't believe us. Like I get a lot of it, oh, it's indigestion, and I still get that. And I know it's not, and a lot of doctors say, no, it's not. But I might get the other as it is. So having people that you can speak to and go, oh, I get that as well. And do you have this? Yeah. It was really, really reassuring. Uh, obviously, we, we support that as much as we humanly can. Um, and, you know, initiatives like sort of, in, in, you know, helping to inform and educate um, rehabilitation professionals, um, obst obstetric professionals in terms of the pregnancy associated scan presentation, um, as well as obviously cl clinicians um, uh, and um, paramedical um, professionals as well. So huge amounts to be done still. But I think, you know, also a lot of progress from a very low starting position. Beat SCAD is a patient-led charity um, that we set up to support people who have had a SCAD and to raise awareness and to raise money for not, not just for the research, but for all our other aims like raising awareness and providing support. We started it in 2015 as three SCAD patients who hadn't been able to find a lot of information online about SCAD. And most of us, both, we all had our SCADs around 2010, 2012, that sort of time. And we just didn't want people to feel as isolated as we did. So we started the charity to, as I say, raise awareness and, and help support people. We, we want to raise awareness within the healthcare profession and it is slowly happening, but there are still people who don't know what SCAD is and don't know how best to manage it. And the research is, is starting to sort of identify ways of managing SCAD that is different to your classic heart disease. We also want to try and make cardiac rehab better for SCAD patients because a lot of them, because of the demographic, because they're, they're a lot younger than other heart patients, they tend to feel sort of quite out of place in cardiac rehab. And they also, a lot of them need mental health support because of the sort of trauma of having something like this happen and you didn't know what you could have done or you, you couldn't have done anything to stop it happening. Obviously we want to provide more funding for research which we've been able to do a lot in the past thanks to our fundraisers. We've, we've um, funded the research to the tune of just over 190,000 so far which is brilliant so thanks go to all our fundraisers. We 
don't have any paid staff, so we are reliant on volunteers to, to help us. So if anybody thinks they have um, some skills that they can help us with, please email us at contact us at beatscad.org.uk. We're looking for, you know, anything from sort of social media help to filmmaking, <laughs> all sorts of stuff that, that we could, if we can get volunteers to do, that leaves the trustees a lot freer to do other things.